Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Miami Beach Urban Studios Live Art Talk. I'm Clint Mello, and I have the pleasure of organizing these talks. Today is special, not only because we have Professor McGuire here, but also we are celebrating the 50 year anniversary of Florida International University opening its doors to students. On September 19, 1972, FIU had its first day of classes in Miami. The university is also celebrating our new rankings with US News. FIU was rated number one as a fastest rising public university within the country, rated the top five for social mobility and top 15 on most innovative public university and top 25 on return on investment. I'm excited about this special art talk that we have with photographer and educator, Bill McGuire. He began his career at FIU in 1975 and has been teaching photography and art history at the university ever since. His photographs and writings have been featured in Aperture Magazine. His works have been collected and exhibited widely, including in New York at the Museum of Modern Art and here in Miami at the Dina Matrani Gallery, the Frost Art Museum and Miami Beach Urban Studios. He's been awarded fellowships from the National Endowment of the Arts and the John Guggenheim Foundation. Bill earned his bachelor's degree from Notre Dame and his graduate degree from the Institute of Design, Chicago. Thank you, Bill, for joining us. I'm handing the screen over to you now. Uh, I, I can't begin to tell you how jumpy I have been about uh, anticipating about this uh, particular session. So this afternoon, I wrote a real short little introduction, then we'll jump right into the photographs. So I managed to get an English degree in college by staying awake some of the time. Then my wife, Susan, suggested I enroll in a master's degree program in teaching, even though I had never once thought about being a teacher. After that, I taught English to seventh graders and high school kids and a couple of years in a small college in Kansas in the late 60s. Kansas was a good place for me to be in the late 60s. Through those years, I realized my ambition was to be a good school teacher, but not an English teacher. I went to the Institute of Design in Chicago, the American Bauhaus, to join its notable program in photography. For a year, I was lost. I made photo montages like the one I'll show you, a kind of Bauhaus staple and got praise, but they bored me. In my second year at the Institute of Design, Gary Winogrand came as a visiting artist. His words and thoughts about photography, as well as his pictures, provided an understanding that changed everything for me but I didn't know where to start. By dumb luck, I happened to have made a few successful photographs at night and in desperation to finish my degree and leave the frozen city for home in Florida. I began to photograph at night in Chicago. It was so cold. We took off for Homestead for 10 days and I went out every night with a camera and tripod. I had become a photographer. Then we moved in with my parents in Homestead and I went to work as a photographer and a drugstore stock boy. They built FIU, and in August of 1975, 46 years ago, I entered the brand new VH111 photo lab. So there's some history. So I have for you here tonight a few of the pictures for your pleasure and amusement, I hope. And here we go. I'd remind you that looking at these slides is very different from looking at the photographs themselves. Uh, they're, a, in many cases, a weak uh, translation. So here we go with a slideshow. Can you see the yes. PowerPoint? Yes, we do. Okay. Uh, slideshow play from start, night. Does everyone see the word night? Yes. Once again, if anyone has questions, just jump in and uh, say, uh, unmute yourself and jump right in or put it in chat and uh, Colette will prompt me on those. Here's one of the photo collages that I did uh, before I actually started photographing. And again, it's one of the, uh, you know, the Maholi Naj's photograms and Hannah Hawk's picture cutups and everything were an inspiration for that. But as I said, it was really cold in Florida. Here's a boat and snow taken from above on a bridge. And I was freezing like crazy there. You know, I, I, <clears throat> the story I always tell is that I was you know, I went out and I'd get so I was shaking so badly, I'd go in a bar and drink a beer and a, a shot and then go back out. And, you know, you can't do that for too long. So we went to Florida and here's uh, one of the photographs taken from the 
windshield of my mother's 57 Chevy on our trip to Florida. And then after graduate school, I moved back to Homestead, as I said, and uh, set up a dark room and began working, all, doing all kinds of photographing, but particularly at night. And since Homestead was nearby, I began to photograph the architecture and some of the places and the characters as well. <clears throat> Most of the architecture that I'm going to show you has been long gone. Some was ravaged by Hurricane Andrew. Some just were about ready to die in the early 70s. The rodeo is also a big was also a big part of Homestead. <clears throat> you know, when I was uh, when I grew up, Homestead was a little town. In the winter, migrant laborers would come and a few snowbirds. Then in the mid-50s, the Air Force put, the Strategic Air Command put 90 B-47s in the, uh, uh, in, in the, at Homestead Air Force Base with all the tankers and Air Force personnel and flyers and so forth, and it changed it. Hurricane Andrew changed everything, and now if you've been to South Bay, you know about the astonishing levels of urban sprawl. This is in Biscayne uh, Park, I think, in Miami. As I said, if anyone has any questions or anything, just follow up. Um, Bill, we have a question in chat yeah. about if you can mention film speak and stock. Um, someone mentioned about what I'm using to make the photographs. Yes. Yes. A 35 millimeter Leica camera with a 35 millimeter lens, tri uh, very heavily overexposed and underdeveloped camera on a tripod exposures ranging from three usually three seconds eight seconds 20 seconds to bracket the exposures this is the young house in uh, hollywood for whom the young circle was named back before it was renovated <laughs> couple of doorways in Little Havana in the early 70s. And this photograph I always find to be a lesson for photographers. As I said, my, you know, whatever else, my greatest ambition is always to be a reasonably good school teacher. And, and as I said, once I became better at photography. I understood that's what I wanted to be a teacher about. <clears throat> and one night I was photographing on South Beach in, I think, 1974, and was leaving town and saw this bar. And I said, OK, I'm coming back. And I'm going to work this place over. <clears throat> and I did. I came back with a tripod one night and was photographing it from one side and another. And I was photographing the door that you see, the doorway that you see on the left, when this kid rode his bicycle up there and stopped just like that. And I, uh, turned the tripod around and leveled it off a bit and told the kid to sit still. And I made three exposures and one of them, he was still for three or four seconds. You know, uh, let me um, Bill, I have a couple here. questions. One from Ray. Sure. Um, do you consider these photos to be lonely? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> well, I think that's partly a quality of the way things look at night. Uh, and there's something about the, the way things are closed down by how light shines upon them. And I, I understand that. I don't think I ever intended that, but I think they, they do resonate with a quality of stillness and, and uh, gazing upon them as you may do in a photograph. And I think that's kind of what produces that that impression. 
I don't know if I answered that question or not, but anyway. Is I there have, another question? I do have another. It says um, from Natalia, what attracted you to photograph at night versus daytime? Well, as I said a minute ago, uh, by dumb luck, <clears throat> I had bought, I, I was in my fourth semester at the Institute of Design, and I knew I didn't want to stay past another semester. And so we came home for Christmas. I borrowed a hundred bucks from my dad, went back to Chicago, bought a 35 millimeter lens that I wanted from the camera store in downtown Chicago, got stuck in traffic in the late evening. It's almost nighttime at four o'clock in Chicago. And I stuck the camera out the window of the truck and steadied myself and because I wanted to shoot something with my brand new lens. And I, I printed those negatives and stared at them trying to figure out what to do. And it's like, bing, the light went off. And that's when I went out and started photographing in Chicago, then came down to Homestead. And then after coming back home to begin to work, here are a few photographs from New Orleans. My brother lives in New Orleans and I would go visit him. And of course, I haven't been back there since Katrina, but it's a, a beautiful city at night. Any other questions, Colette? You're muted. You're muted, Colette. Thank you, Ray. I do have a comment I just read to you. So sorry. These are amazing photos. It's really surreal in nature and it's very retro, almost looks like a look into a different world, especially during the night. Well, I think that's kind of the nature of photographs, you know, that they're, <clears throat> they stare. There's also a, a lesson here for photographers. At, at a certain point, I began to realize I had to discipline myself about photographing at night. That it is not eat late enough so I'd feel groggy when it got dark. And I decided, okay, I'll consider my evening done if I've stopped at three places. Oh, what I meant to say about the boy on the bicycle picture too is that sometimes you, you intend to do one thing and something else happens. Similarly with this, uh, I had photographed as much as I planned to that night. I was going up through Louisiana into Arkansas and I drove past this place and I was about five miles down the road and I thought, no, I've got to go back. Uh, not unlike Dorothea Lang and the migrant mother. Thank you for that comment, by the way. Here's a very early uh, night picture of Miami across the airport. So I would travel in my van and uh, <clears throat> wander around places and then park in parking lots and sleep. Uh, <clears throat> got banged on my window by the cops any number of times. Hospital parking lots are good if you need to sleep in your car overnight, by the way. Here's the construction of the busway around uh, Orion. I really love this photograph. A cold night in Indiana. I have a comment. Um, one is, it is a great choice to use black and white. It acts extreme dynamic and clarity, but why did you choose that over color? Well, <clears throat> uh, in a way, I began these photographs at a time when serious photographers tended not to work in color. <clears throat> but we have to remember that occasionally photographers, serious photographers would work in color, but more often than not, color was for advertising and yearbook pictures and that kind of a thing. And serious photographers in this time in the early 70s still work in black and white. That changed, of course, with the photographs by William Eggleston, the whole world of color photography emerged after that, along with photography, a much higher percentage of women who were photographers. 
<laughs> so plus, plus uh, I think even had the color option been more available, and I did do some photographing at night in color, I think there's something about black and white that uh, accentuates the question of the starkness of the places and the, the, the length of time looking at stuff. Be able to I don't know if that answers any questions, but I doubt if I have any answers to questions. There's no particular narrative here, of course, or something like that. The photographs are entirely episodic. Uh, they're the product of uh, trying to be, you know, of photographing in my life as well as in, uh, in any, as well as being after anything in particular. These boys. I went down and asked, I stopped, I parked up the hill a ways, and this is in North Carolina one night, and uh, I went down and said, hey, will you guys be in my picture? And I said, okay, I'll raise my hand, and you got to stand real still. And they thought that meant just not turning around and walking around or something. And <clears throat> so I raised my hand, and there they were talking and gesturing to one another. So I walked down, and I stood like frozen in front of them for about 10 seconds, and they got it. I think this might be in Kokomo, Indiana, where Patty Wright is. I photographed this kid from the side and from the front and a couple other different ways, and he never even looked at me. It's funny to see an old phone booth like that. Oh, yeah. Bill, how did you determine your exposures? Um, well, uh, let me go back a bit. I thought I could stick to that. Um, <clears throat> let me go back. Well, initially, <clears throat> Initially, when I first started photographing at night, when I was in Chicago, <clears throat> I used a meter, but then I saw the meter kept saying the same thing all the time. So I began to realize that metering wasn't really going to do it. For the most part, if the place was well lighted, an eight second exposure at F4 uh, would be about right. But as I said, I typically would, would bracket the exposures, one at about three seconds, one about eight or 10 seconds, one about 20 or 25 seconds. The last one in this slideshow, though, is from FIU, uh, and it was about a 10-minute exposure. But with 35, it was usually, I'd usually bracket at 3, 10, 25, approximately. And one of the three negatives would be the best. Occasionally, it'd be one or the other. This is a little bit later with the Mamiya 7. See the difference in the format, likewise. We have a question about why you chose a 35 millimeter. Uh, Medium format for such a slow, long exposure. Well, <clears throat> you know, uh, for, one, for one thing, it's easy. And you can take a lot of exposures without changing film. I, you know, I wonder if, and another, if I had my life to live over again, that I might have used uh, the Roloflex that I had more, or if I might have used uh, a view camera or something like that. But in many cases, and it probably was unnecessary paranoia, but in, in many cases, I felt like I wanted to hit and run. The, the one photograph of that facade in New Orleans that you saw a few minutes ago, for example, I mean, I pulled up, this is a really rough part of town. I pulled up, opened my van door, got out, left the engine running while I made the exposures in case I had to jump into the van and get out of there. Now, I have to admit that I think that was a lot of it was stupid paranoia. 
but uh, it was convenient and it's what I had. I also had a, a Rolleiflex. I admit that in, in some cases, a bigger camera would have been uh, a better choice. But the Leica camera with that lens, that lens is super sharp, absolutely excellent contrast. Here a stock car race and some godforsaken place. The checkers. You know, I, I'm, <clears throat> for the sake of some, I, I, <clears throat> I want to uh, remind you of the importance of influences and certainly um, perhaps for these night photographs, the biggest influences is the, are the photographs of Walker Evans. Here's the Desert Inn uh, in Yeehaw Junction up in North Central Florida. Uh, it was a notorious um, bordello. Sofia Valiente said it was where the cowboys came to relieve their tensions. Uh, unfortunately, a, a year or so ago, a semi went out of control and crashed into it, and it's been demolished. This last one is actually from FIU, and when I was teaching a night class some years ago, there'd be times when nobody needed any help, so I'd go out and walk around campus put the tripod of the Mamiya 7 in place, and then I would shoot the flash off to one side onto these leaves here like 10 times, and then go around and do some more on the other side. So the exposures were 10 minutes long at maybe F8 or at 11 on the Mamiya 7, a six by seven centimeter negative. Okay, now I'm gonna show you another PowerPoint. Are you getting ready with your other PowerPoint? I have a question. Yes. Um, okay. Your subjects look don't look arbitrary. It seems if you're recalled to them in some way, how often do you predetermine the subject and set them up at night? Uh, rarely were they predetermined. They were almost always the product of walking around and seeing uh, something that might have been lighted. Uh, and, you know, I didn't. I didn't care what I photographed. If if the light was strong, that was all that was important. You know? So there was no predetermination. I I had a particular affinity, of course, for architecture. I also liked it when they, when I would see people around a certain place, like the guy filling up his tank of gas, or the kids in the pickup truck, and you know, smile and say, "Let me take your picture," you know, and I'd say, "Hold real still," and. You know, and I'd kind of freeze and, and just freeze like a statue and they would kind of get it, you know, the sort of way to do that. Any other before we go on? I to the do. Next? Um, have you returned to any of the places where you took these photographs to see if anything has changed? And do you feel like taking another photograph? Or if maybe you feel like taking another photograph? <sighs> Well, some of them are far away, and in terms of, of the architecture and homestead, almost all of it's gone. So, and at the same time, uh, and after I retire shortly, I might well uh, do this, and that is go back into the work that I did, particularly in the 70s around homestead, and then go back and try to reframe that exactly the same way and show what astonishing, I mean, when I was when we were first living back here in '72, there were still railroad tracks up on the up on the corner. Now there's the busway, for example, and you know the astonishing. I don't know if there's any place in the country that's changed as much as South Dade, south of Cutler Ridge, let's say. So, but no, uh, <clears throat> as I said, occasionally I would see something and and uh, say to myself, "Well, I want to get back 
want to get back there again. Yes, it would be interesting to see that. Yes, thank you. Indeed, it would. Okay, we ready for the next uh, bunch of pictures? Yes. All right, let's see what I've got going here. Okay. Oops, I gotta do this. Do you see this uh, uh, presentation? Not no. yet. Not yet. No. All right, I'm sorry, I forget. forgot to do screen share. Okay, do you see it now? Yes. <laughs> Sacred Heart School, it's gone now. I think it's a little charter school, but it was a school in Homestead, which started in the era when dioceses wanted <clears throat> uh, uh, parishes to set up their own schools. They were staffed by <clears throat> uh, Franciscan nuns, who of course taught for nothing, uh, and that it changed radically over the years, but I went to this school when it first opened when I was in sixth grade, then they added seventh grade and eighth grade. So for three years, I was, and several of my friends were uh, the kings and queens of this little school. I got a rude awakening after that, but I'll spare you that story. In any case, in the 80s, my daughter and son were both going there. And so uh, at the start of the school year one day, I thought I'd get out and photograph around the schoolyard. And I did that for a couple of more mornings. And then I thought, well, the next time I stopped, I thought, oh, no, I've done that. But then I remembered that I told my class, people in my class, if you think you've photographed someplace or something for a couple of, a couple of times and that you've done it, forget about it. You're just beginning. So for about three years, I photographed often two, three times a week. In the, mostly in the 15 minutes before school started, <clears throat> the, there would be uh, uh, 10 kids on the, on the schoolyard when I got there, and then there'd be 150 or 200 within 15 minutes when the bell rang. And they were all shined up and everything and full of energy. The light was beautiful in the early morning and so forth. So here are a number of photographs from that schoolyard over that time. This, of course, probably couldn't be done these days, the level of paranoia about photographing one's children and all the rest of that. But I knew the principal of the school and my kids had gone there and I'd gone there. So I didn't realize at the time what an extraordinary opportunity it was. I, you know, Hi, Bill, I, can you <laughs> hold for a second? Um, I just wanted to double check. It seems like a couple people are having problems seeing your screen. I see it. Um... Well, I'll stop share and go back. Should okay, we try again? To try again? Yep. I was. Okay. I saw that there's a few people that said they weren't seeing it. Okay. Any better luck now? It's good for me. Sorry. Okay. I see people saying they see it. Okay. Good. Sorry. Whatever that means. Um. <clears throat> I don't think photographs have narrative. They don't tell stories, really. They might imply a narrative. This is a Winogrand idea. And uh, a few of them do. And to me, this one, you know, like I said, I'm a teacher more than anything else. And I, I think there's a lesson here in this particular photograph, which I'm just crazy about this picture. Uh, we see these three girls sharing secrets and laughing, the blonde ponytail and the ear of the girl and her bun on her head. But the important character is the other girl who's left out or perhaps is being laughed at by this scene. And I, th I think that's one of the kind of marvelous things that photographs can do. Whenever they would mug for the camera, I just turn away and play like I didn't see them. I really tried to be inconspicuous, but you know, they knew not to perform for the camera. This was a while ago. The girl on the left holding the other girl's hair is my daughter, who's now in her 50s. <laughs> Time flies. 
I love this picture. What good luck. You know, I, I think a photographer has to work like crazy and still rely upon, upon good luck. It's Chrono's favorite photograph. My God. <laughs> uh, you know, we're, we see, okay, I'll, I'll move on. I have at least one more, one more PowerPoint to show you. We're going to go to 8.30, and then we're going to stop at 8.30. I almost kicked this one out today, but then I thought, I've gone through this PowerPoint like 20 times and <clears throat> knocked out two or three at a time until it's down to this fairly tight bunch. I almost knocked this one out today, but then I thought, wow, that kid is so good. Mm. Totally inept. I like complexity in photographs too. I like that car parked way over there under that tree. Hmm. Isn't that good? Some of these kids my daughter still has contact with since she was their contemporaries. There are good stories and there are serious tragedies amongst them all. <clears throat> the blonde girl in the middle, <clears throat> my daughter got busted for shoplifting. Boys. Mm -hmm. I'm a grandfather, I have nine grandchildren, and boy, I'm really sympathetic to this old dude. I don't know if this photograph really carries and I almost kicked it out today, but some real tragedy had happened. Some kid had been in a wreck. Um, Roland Barthes talks about punctum in photographs. Uh, broadly speaking, it's a particular something around which pretty much everything else hinges in the photograph as supporting characters, as it were. And I think it's in this one, the boy's hand uh, holding the basketball and all the other stuff. To me, this is maybe the most successful photograph in the whole bunch. The, the kid is getting it from his mother and his teacher in the light and he's holding that ball like that. Well, so. <clears throat> Any questions about all that? And I'll show you another PowerPoint. I don't. I don't see any questions, but it's interesting that you mentioned um, Bart's about the punctum. I was going to ask you about that, and you mentioned it already. So, yeah, well, it, it's an interesting notion, and there are certain photographs that 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 holds true for the 
I think one is the Cartier-Bresson photograph of the guy jumping over the puddle and the, 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 <clears throat> the punctum, I'm not fond of that word especially, <clears throat> is, the, is the, the man's heel as it's about to break the surface of the puddle that he's standing in. Okay, here we go with another one. This is a bit longer. We'll see how we go. How, you know, <clears throat> uh, I realize I'm showing a lot of photographs and I realize that not everyone has the same appetite as others. Do you see the PowerPoint? Yes. 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 All right, here we go. Here and there. One of the things I did when we first came back to Florida in 72 was that I'd go up Old Cutler Road to a place called the Cliffs, where the 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 canal cuts through Cutler Ridge, where it comes very close to the bay. And on Sundays, particularly in the hot summer, all these kids would gather there and jump in the water and flirt around and you know do the stuff kids do it's all been fenced off now and so forth but it's was a, a wonderful place and and uh, so sundays i would go there and hang around and and photograph <clears throat> once again the slides uh, are in some cases a far cry from what the photographs look like in terms of the tonal range and so forth but you'll have to just forgive that It was a wonderful scene. You know, I was I would always have like long pants and a, a shirt on and stuff, and they never, you know, I, I fit right in. I put a couple of hundred thousand miles uh, on motorcycles and uh, not in the last few years, but I've always found them to be the most marvelous conception. I'm sorry, if someone could mute themselves. Not sure who that is. Bill, I have a couple questions. Um, sure. Have you ever considered presenting your work in a gallery or presenting them to a magazine, which I think you have, um, oh, but I don't want to answer yeah, that for you, but go for there it. There's some, but you know, I've just never been very successful about all that. I've shown at Dina Matrani's gallery, I had a wonderful little show there some years ago, a few years ago some really good shows at FIU's gallery or museum before it became the frost and odds of odds and ends of other things I don't know I, you know I I never liked showing I like to show people photographs but I don't like shows that I guess I don't know I don't know how to explain that really and you also had a show at Miami Beach Urban Studios Yes, a while uh, back, we back. might we might get to the final PowerPoint, the fifth one, a fairly short one, which is early black and white photographs from a swap meet in Homestead, and then the color ones that I showed at Embus a few years ago of uh, a swap meet in Princeton, Florida. And then I have a question. How many photos did you take during this bunch? Curious about your edit editing process. Uh, as far as at this particular place, you know, I probably shot 40 rolls of film over there at least, maybe 50 or 60. And, you know, you look at them and you see that most of them are failures, but once in a while, one of them is successful beyond your hopes. 
And then I have yeah. a recommendation from Natalia saying maybe a book. Well, now, yes, that would be swell. <laughs> uh, and the problem is I've got an inquiry from a guy named Joe Bellows in a, a very good gallery in La Jolla. But the problem is I haven't made, I've sold some prints, but I don't have many prints. So I don't have product. Bill, it's a wonderful gallery. I visited it a few times. Uh -huh, yeah. I have you know, my my son, the photographer, and, and our grandkids live there, and uh, oh, wow. he's become uh, he's he's he loves yeah. that gallery, and they love him too. It's a very good gallery. Yeah. He, did you know Paul McDonough? Yep. Mm -hmm. Paul McDonough. Well, Paul's in bad shape with Alzheimer's apparently, but Paul also has work at uh, Bellows Gallery. Yeah. I have another question. What, um, to you, what determines a successful or failed photograph? <laughs> ah. <laughs> uh, well, you know what Andy Warhol said uh, <laughs> a good photograph was uh, of a famous person and in focus. I, I'd say it's kind of like that, but, uh, you know, I mean, there has to be some quality of, oh, importance to what the photograph has elevated in a way you know as i said they're not narratives they, they don't tell long-term stories they might imply something has or will happen uh, but uh it doesn't really do that so i it, it for me it's do i like it you know do i think it's really something that i you know something i hadn't seen before i guess is one way to look at it Here's the color one. Here's some photographs of cars. South Beach. Most of these were taken from the window of my van. See the child. I realize I'm showing a lot of photographs. Um, <clears throat> I think I was mentioning this to uh, Colette recently when we were getting ready for this. And <clears throat> particularly in the last couple of years, I've begun to see that there is a kind of a connection or a similarity between reading comprehension and looking at photographs comprehension. We understand that there are people who are fast readers with a high level of comprehension, slow readers with a high level of comprehension, fast readers with low comprehension, slow readers with no comprehension, and people who can, uh, you know, not really read much at all, <clears throat> except what's necessary. And it's true with photographs as well. As I said, I realize I'm showing you a lot of photographs, and of course, people can leave whenever they feel like they can't stand it anymore. <clears throat> but uh, I think there's a, a certain thing about reading pictures and in the history of photography class, I'm constantly preaching at them about uh, <clears throat> um, 
learning to read photographs, learning to see, not interpret, not to put words on them, not to find comments to make, but just to take them in, look at them, look at them and, and feel, you know, feel the experience of what you're looking at rather than reaction to it. I realize that's a paradox. Is is that experience the same experience of like just salt that you have with the sculpture, like like the minimalists we're talking about? Is it similar to that or no? Say that again, Colette. Just, I don't is like it just salt, the gasalt, the um the feeling of walking around a sculpture? It's different. Well, uh, I, I don't I don't know if I'd make any kind of comparison like that. I'm sorry, my I'm jiggling the screen here. So, oh, um, well, you know, I think maybe we would have to back up and talk about the psychology of how we look at things in our lives. I mean, our our attention is constantly drawn to one thing or another, and a photograph. You know, for example, there are two iconic photographs from Vietnam. The one of the girl, the young girl who's been burned by napalm and is running naked, screaming toward the camera. And the other is where a guy is getting shot in the head. Both of those are on film, but the films don't carry that power, but the still photographs do. And there's something about what happens when everything is frozen in front of you and you begin to see that you can really read it over. I mean, we see two young men and two dogs and, you know, the, the one guy who notices his photograph is being taken is one thing, but those two dogs are extraordinary in the picture. <laughs> it's like, they're really into it. Yeah, me, you know, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm getting carried away. <laughs> I have a couple comments. Um, what is this? Oh, someone said about reading pictures quickly uh -huh. um and then i have another uh do you find subjects back in the day more interesting to photograph than those of today mm, as far as reading them quickly I, I think for example that the way one reads a photograph quickly is that there's a kind of a a, a view that where you see everything sort of all at once and then you start to look at the pieces. Okay, let's let me go back a sec. You know, we see stuff. We see buildings and a pickup truck back and a tank of a barrel full of gas or something like that. But the central characters are these two dogs and these two men, and and so uh, I I think we I don't know. There is an interesting question about the physical nature of how we look at photographs, and I think that's up for grabs. And, and, you know, come to think of it, I don't have any solid notion about that, other than, I think for me, at least personally, there's a kind of a, you take it all in, in a kind of one way, and then start to, start to dig into the little things, like the expressions on the faces of the dogs here, for example. I'm not sure if that's true or not. Um, let me um, let me finish up that quote. I didn't quite get it to. So it, this is true. I read pictures quickly, but these are like candy. That's what um, the comment was. And then here's a question. Do you find subjects back in the day more interesting to photograph than those of today? No, no. I think the world is constantly changing, constantly interesting. Obviously, the old buildings and homestead aren't there anymore. So so there, there are certain things that change styles. There's certain things that have radically changed, of course, in terms of our, mm, uh, let's say things have changed since 9-11, okay? And, th and things have changed in other ways in terms of people being very protective about their children. And so there are things like that and dozens and dozens of others. But, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> and I think, for example, I think, yes, there is a change if we get to the swap meet pictures, which I'm not sure if we'll have time for them or not, uh, the ones I took with the Leica were all like taken by holding the camera up to my eyes. 
the ones at the swap meet in color were all taken by photo shooting from the hip, as they say. Um, there's a comment um, from, um, I see many photographs where the full frame is shown. How important is it in your work? Well, uh, <clears throat> you see a black line around the picture and that's an indication that the negative carrier has been filed out <laughs> so that we see everything that's on the negative. Um, admittedly, it will do something to hold in the sky once in a while and that kind of a thing, but uh, it shouldn't be necessary, really. I love both of these photographs very much. And, you know, uh, in some cases, I think it's up to the viewer to provide awareness of what is intended or the innuendo in the photograph. Here we have this, I'm not sure of the painting, it's, it was in the National Gallery in Washington years ago. But here we have these women who seem to be threatened by this soldier who apparently is holding a sword or some kind. And here we have this man wearing this shirt that plays off of that. For years, my dad had season tickets to the Dolphins game back in the very early days. And I'd sometimes go with him. When he brought my mother, I didn't have a ticket, but I'd go beg tickets at the at the front. And I must have shot 200 rolls of film at, uh, inside at the Dolphin during Dolphins games when you could go anywhere you wanted to. I think I maybe got three good pictures out of that. Here are a few from open house at Homestead Air Force Base. And the, the Air Force Base was a big part of my childhood, of course, with all those bombers and stuff. Wow. Oh, good, whoever said that. <laughs> Is that you, Rylan? <laughs> we have a too. question, Bill, um, um, from um, Brian. Um, who bought your first camera, and do you still have it? Oh, I had I had a you know a Hawkeye camera, plastic Hawkeye, when I was like ten years old, something like that. I bought a fairly serious thirty-five when I was about nineteen, and uh, <clears throat> and then a thirty-five millimeter camera when I was in college. So it was an odd collection. You, you know, I was always interested in photographs, although not that interested in photography. Uh, and it wasn't it wasn't until I was well into my 20s when I was got to be at least be, the beginnings of being more interested in uh, photographing. I began photographing action at football games and stuff like that. There's a funny story about this photograph. And it, again, I think it's a lesson for photographers. The truth is, I was in a line waiting to get into this airplane to see what the inside of it looked like. And there was this woman standing over here that I was really interested in. And I wanted to take a photograph that she was in just for her to be in. I don't even remember these people, this woman and three kids, but they, as it turned out, are arch typical Air Force wives, her calves and her dress and everything else. And then these three magical children that are following behind her a couple of rainy days. This is just up the road from where I live. It's in terrible shape right now. And a few from South Beach. Uh, <clears throat> Poodle Patty, who was a legendary character, always dressed in costumes. This was back in the early 70s.
I have a question from Nick. Um, have you ever, have you shot the more recent development in South Dade and do you feel compelled to document it? <clears throat> well, I mentioned before that uh, there have been times and I've actually done a little preliminary work with this of where I would go back and look at photographs that I took maybe in the 70s and that it, it's radically changed. As I mentioned, <clears throat> where the railroad crossed uh, Newton Road uh, is now the busway and that's emblematic of uh, a gazillion other changes. <clears throat> and of course, there's a wealth of, of material and negatives that I haven't really looked at since back then that might even be more provocative. And the idea to go back there and to re-photograph these places, <clears throat> I think, I don't think it would be the same thing. It would be much different. And certainly the, <clears throat> the way Homestead looks is nothing like it looks then. So it's kind of a moot point in a way. I don't know what to tell you about other than that. Um, okay, let's see, it's only 8.02. So we're going to go to yet another PowerPoint. If you can't stand it, well, just hang in there. I think your work is amazing. People are going to stay on. All Don't right. worry. Don't worry. OK, so here, let's share. And you see the PowerPoint? Yes. In 1998. Uh, Manolo Torres and I and uh, <clears throat> uh, took a group of, I don't know, 17 or 18 art and art history majors to San Pedro de Atacama, which is in the north of Chile in the Atacama Desert. It's a, a oasis in the midst of the Atacama Desert. And we spent uh, several weeks there and then spent a few days in Bolivia after that. And it is a, was, is a magical place. I don't know if Donna and Manolo are still on the, the uh, Zoom session, but <clears throat> Manolo went back there. Uh, this is Manny uh, Torres, uh, who taught at FIU, taught art history and so forth for many decades. And we miss him terribly from being a, on our faculty. But <clears throat> he went there when it was a very old-fashioned and primitive and so forth. And since then, it's become kind of an eco-tourist site with hotels, with uh, private airports and so forth. You fly in and go to all the phenomenon uh, connected with the Atacama Desert. Um, it's, it's where they practiced lunar vehicles uh, for the moon landing. There is a place called Valle de la Luna, the Valley of the Moon. And it is indeed a astounding landscape, but there's also, I don't know what it's like now, and this is of course more than 20 years ago that we were there, uh, but it is dusty and dry, the, the Atacama Desert, there are places where there have never been any recorded rainfall, and uh, it's so different from South Florida that you can't imagine. It's very beautiful and very strange. The days <clears throat> that we were there, of course, it was <clears throat> very warm, and, and the light was very bright. It wasn't warm, that much warm, but it was very bright. The sunlight was so strong. There were very few clouds, if ever. <clears throat> and so we would wait until about four in the afternoon and go out and begin to photograph these pathways and, and sites that you see in the old part of San Pedro. How old might that tree be? I almost kicked out the cat picture, but I better, figured I better keep it. Uh, San Pedro is a very interesting place. It apparently was a kind of a, on a crossroads, an oasis on the crossroads between all kinds of trading activity between uh, coastal South America and the Andes and so forth. And so buried in the tombs there are uh, 
desiccated mummies that go back millennia and more. And the clothing or the, the textiles with which they were buried are in extraordinary shape because of the dryness of the desert. Textiles that came from Bolivia and other places that they would have uh, disintegrated in those kinds of climates were preserved in those uh, burials. <clears throat> Roxanne, there's Willie. Yes, <laughs> got my son, so you can see these awesome pictures. Oh, cool. There's Taka Taka. And Bill, um, Donna Torres and Manny are on the call. They just wanted to oh. say hi and thanks oh, for great. sharing oh, me. Great. And here's Manolo himself pointing out something to somebody in uh, San Pedro that summer for that winter. We went on a camping trip to see the uh, petroglyphs scratched in the side of the hillside. If Michael Balbone was here, we'd have something to say about him. And it was an, a rather extraordinary uh, landscape, stark and beautiful. Here an abandoned uh, house made of mud and rocks. It's a very strange and minimal kind of landscape. They said lunar in so many ways. The most important geological, the most, the most powerful geological figure is Lincoln Kabur, this triangular mountain that you see more or less in the center of the photograph. It's a volcano that's been idle for a long time. All of the, all of the burials in the desert surrounding San Pedro were buried in a fetal position in a more or less a cylindrical type of uh, tomb <clears throat> with facing Lincoln Kabur. And so here's a series of photographs of the landscape with Lincoln Kabur. But then. Probably some art student trick. <clears throat> it's a magical place, by the way. If you Google San Pedro de Atacama, oh, you know, it'll be full of ads for the resort hotels and things, but there are also lots of photographs of the place, and it's uh, Extraordinary. <clears throat> uh, Donna and Manolo's uh, daughter, Christina, has done extensive research in the collection of skeletal remains that this Jesuit priest unearthed in the early part of the 20th century. Here's some ancient ruins. I don't know the details of them. I can't remember. As I said, someone asked a question a while ago about did I plan things? And with our little walks <clears throat> in the afternoon around San Pedro, out kind of from the town out into the surrounding areas, it's not as if I was like find, looking to find scenes in which Lincoln Kabur was a distant presence, but they would just appear. You couldn't help but seeing them. Here's Manolo Torres as we're heading for Bolivia. Uh, llama uh, fetuses and uh, La Paz, Bolivia. Jeez. Okay, I got one more slideshow for those of you who have stuck around through thick and thin. We still have a lot of people. Your work, your work is speaking to us. Oh, thanks. This, um, <clears throat> this is a fairly short one. Uh, swap. See this? Do you see the uh, PowerPoint? 
Yes. So here are a few early uh, photographs taken at a swap meet down in Homestead. It used to be a drive-in movie theater, <clears throat> and the drive-in screen was still there. And for a while, they showed like a little softcore porn there. And <clears throat> but then they now it's a Win Dixie and a few derelict stores. Buy some puppies. It was all the stuff that was evocative of other lives. The slides here are a, a bit rough. The scans are a bit rough in terms of the contrast. Aren't they wonderful? Kind of snap pictures of his pictures. I think that with Angelina. And then here are a few from the Embus show <clears throat> photographs taken at a swap meet in Princeton, just about oh five miles or so up US one from Homestead. It's all taken with a little uh, point and shoot kind of like a um, digital camera. I oh, mean, I saw these guys coming. <clears throat> <laughs> I want to do this. Is you know, it, I have a question. Is this a 40th Street flea market? No, this is uh, in Princeton, Florida, which is just north of the black and white ones were in Homestead, down in Homestead itself, in a long gone flea market. But this one is in uh, Princeton, which is like, as I said, four or five miles north of Homestead on US 1. It's, it's real active on Sundays still. And there's a, a farmer's market there as well that's open all week long with all kinds of fruits mm -hmm. and vegetables and fish and all kinds of other stuff, cheeses and stuff. It's I a wonderful it, scene. We probably need to rewind. Uh, I'm sorry, somebody, uh, if you could mute yourself, you're coming through trying to. These slides are also a bit on the rough side. So you have to do I think this is, you know, maybe this is trying to make a point again, the lesson as it were. <clears throat> this is a very hard to look at photograph because there's nothing really bold in it. And, but to me, it's one of the really ones that I like as much as any of them because there's <clears throat> there's something everywhere and yet there's nothing inherently important in the picture other than perhaps the woman's hand. Love this picture. This woman, I photographed her. I photographed her like probably at 10 different Sundays. I photographed her. She was hustling all kinds of stuff. She never once noticed or never looked one or the other. And here are her fingernails, of course, are dangerous. Uh, 
I have a few comments um, and questions. Um, if you do not have the opportunity to live in Homestead, which is a very unique place, would your images be very different? Well, I don't know. That's that's another world, isn't it? Had I had I so what if I had stayed in Chicago if they'd given me a job up there and we hadn't moved back to Florida? I don't know. You know, I, I think I was ready to go to work wherever I was. And uh, after after finishing graduate school and, and beginning to do night photographs and realizing that here was something that was terrifically interesting, that I could do it, that the Leica was perfect for it. It was mobile and fast and so forth. And uh, so, uh, you know, I mean, fate has, you know, I, like I said, you know, I think I was six years old when my parents moved here from Brooklyn. My parents had retired from the army after World War II. And uh, my grandparents had moved here earlier and that's what brought them here. So, and it was a, a kind of a little paradise at the time. I mean, it's full of bigotry and exploitation of uh, migrant laborers and racism and all kinds of stuff, but still. I have a, a question about recent work. Are you still uh, doing photography now? Do you have recent work? This is pretty recent though, isn't it? Yeah, this it? is within the last few years. The, the yeah. more recent stuff I've been photographing a bit in the Everglades. I'm particularly interested in the uh, dwarf cypress forest, which is uh, oh, about 10 miles in from the visitor center uh, from going down in Flamingo gallery wow well that's all folks uh any questions or comments let me know i love questions bill uh, oh chrono oh, i better not read that well so one question uh bill what what uh did you have any temptation to shoot the atacama desert in color i've seen some gorgeous photographs from that area in color. Um, you know, I've I tried photographing, especially I tried photographing with the Mamiya Seven, with uh, Portriga and so forth. But you know, I just never got that interested in it. I always loved black and white so much, and I knew particularly that what I knew of the Atacama Desert was, I I knew I didn't want to photograph in color. Mm -hmm. So. I, you know, I, I don't have a, a really good answer for that because indeed it is, its colors are, and, you know, particularly, as I said now a couple of times, seeing these slides is a very different thing from looking at the photographs themselves. And the ones that suffer from it most are probably the uh, San Pedro ones because, and I, I only included a couple of landscapes that I find the most beautiful because they simply don't translate at all to the uh, <clears throat> to the zoom screen to the computer screen, mm -hmm. and the, the delicacy of the uh, of the uh, tonal range is such that it, it just doesn't translate. So I didn't even try to put them on this. It was only one of them that I did. And it's not very. It doesn't show the doesn't show the richness of the picture very successfully. But there you go. Wow. wow. You have a lot of wonderful comments saying thank you, um, enjoyed your work. I have a question about the orchid thief. I'm not sure if you've seen that movie or adaption. adaption. Oh, yeah, sure. I read that book also uh, uh -huh. about the ghost orchid. Yeah, it's a fascinating story. That was a good movie. Oh, Carol, Patty's friend, Carol. Hello, Carol. Good to see you. I want to say hello to a few characters I see. Nice to see you. Yes, wow. Carol. Bill, uh, Bill, Susan Orleans is an old friend of mine. And uh, if if you liked her work, I'll I'll connect you guys. Maybe there's a collaboration opportunity. For sure. Please do. That'd be great. Oh, Zotempari. Wow, it's been a million years. Hi, Zotempari. Good to see you. Hi. I was in our classes a while ago. Well, well okay, folks.
That was wonderful, Bill. Thank you so much. I think we should do another talk soon. Maybe show us some of your more recent work. And I know um, maybe some stuff from FIU. You never know. So Well, one thing we might do um, is over the years, a lot of photographs accumulated in the closet in the photo lab at FIU. And I wanted to make sure they were safe. So I brought them home a few years ago. And then um, I've scanned some of them and in our Sunday night, by the way, on Monday nights at seven o'clock, we regularly hold a meeting for a couple of hours and people will show work. So if any of you have slides of your work or would just like to join us on uh, Monday evenings at seven o'clock, the Zoom numbers are exactly the same ones for this group tonight. So if you'd like to join us, do not hesitate. We'd love to have more participation in those Monday night sessions, which have always been interesting. I mean, once in a while, they're real interesting, and some of the time they're a little boring, but uh, for the most part, they're, they've always been worthwhile. Just to shock the hell out of us one night, for example, we've got a big grin now. We feel guilty about that. So anyway, uh, <clears throat> please join us then. Um, and maybe we could do a session <clears throat> showing some of the wonderful work from the uh, from the FIU archive. Mostly, it's mostly black and white, mostly from the mid 1970s up into the mid 90s or so. That sounds okay, great. So, so you might look forward to that down the road a ways. That sounds wonderful. Okay. So. Bill, if we wanted to um, see the recording of this of tonight's presentation, can we do that? I How think so. Yes, um, I'm presuming I'm going to get the recording, and Colette certainly will. And uh, if you would like it, let me know. Colette uh, schooled me on how to do we transfer, so I'm pretty sure that would be a good way to uh, transfer that to you. And we, we will also have it up on our YouTube channel so I can send you a link, Bill. And of course cool. you'll get a copy of it. So we'll have it on our YouTube channel for everyone to enjoy. We'll probably have it by um, end of this week or early next week. We just do a okay, quick great. edit, yep. All right, and if, if anyone uh, <clears throat> needs that, get in touch. I know Before Carol I would you... like it. She missed the first part. Who's that? Carol, Navarro. Oh, yeah. Okay, for sure. We'll have it definitely. So, well, it was amazing, Bill. Thank you so much. Oh, it was thanks. Ha great having everyone <laughs> here, and and what a wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, it's almost <clears throat> like a, a a survey of your work. So, yes, um, yes, yes. I look forward to uh, <laughs> seeing some more of it soon. I want to want to say hello quick to a couple more. Sure. I didn't notice Alex Dominguez is there. Savannah. Sonia and, and uh, Mr. Addison Love, <clears throat> good to see you very much. And let's see who else. Debbie Alley joined us. Good to see you, Debbie. <clears throat> if I missed anybody else, well, and Jasek, I see, and Renee got there. So excellent. How, how flattering that you all were here. And George is here, George. Good to see you, George. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. Thank you. you all, everyone. Carlos. Carlos.